about our project, The Alchemy of Blue. This is an exciting collaboration between me, a blind rug weaver, and Dyer from York, and myself, Amelie Crepe, a London-based textiles print designer. Today we are having a conversation with Dr. John Lee all about medieval cloth. Dr. Lee is a research associate at the Center for Medieval Studies, who teaches a variety of courses in medieval and local history at the University of York. He is also the author of the books The Medieval Clothier and Commemorations in Medieval Cambridge. But first, The Alchemy of Blue. What is the connection between Dr. John Lee and the collaboration between Emily and I? Emily and I met at the London Design Fair in 2019. We discovered we shared a common fascination with textiles, color, pattern, texture, and natural fibers, and decided to combine our individual expertise by working together on a collaborative project. Our continued discussion led us to the idea of creating a textile art installation, the results of which will be exhibited at the prestigious Collect Art Fair in spring 2022 at Somerset House in London. We are grateful for the support of the Crafts Council UK and Arts Council England National Lottery Project Grant. The exhibit, a hand woven length measuring 50 centimeters by seven meters, incorporates luxurious natural fibers, including British wool in shades of traditional woad and indigo blue plant dyes. Our study features two different varieties of plants which have been historically used to produce the color blue for centuries in the textiles industry. But we wanted to discover more about how the fibres, weaving and dyeing processes in the UK became especially popular throughout the medieval times and how it connects our passion for textiles, both personally and professionally. In order to do this, we contacted Dr John Lee to highlight and elaborate upon the importance of our hometowns, York and Lapland, in relation to both textiles and the colour blue. We present to you Dr John Lee. Many thanks for joining us today, John, and sharing with us your knowledge and stories. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to meet you and learn more about your project. Jacqueline lives in York and I grew up in Lapland in Suffolk. What makes these two very different places interesting? when comparing their link with the cloth trade? And was there any connection between the two? Well, around 1500, York is an established city with a long-standing cloth industry that's really struggling in the face of competition from cloth making in the rural area round about. Whereas Lavenham is a booming small town with a thriving textile industry that's grown over the previous century and stimulated lots of new building within the town. The two places don't have any direct connections between them that I'm aware of, other than both having important textile industries in the Middle Ages. In York, as I say, we've had a long established textile industry. In fact, archeology span has uncovered Anglo-Scandinavian artifacts. And we know that by the mid 1100s, from documentary evidence that the weavers in York had formed themselves into an association known as a guild for which they paid um, the king yearly for various privileges including a monopoly on cloth making in the county. By the later 1300s cloth production in York was really thriving and York was producing broadcloths which were exported through Hull but during the second half of the 1400s, cloth production is moving out of the city and increasingly centred on rural villages, particularly in the air and colder valleys of Yorkshire and in other parts of the country too, including the Stour Valley of Suffolk, where Lavenham is growing. Lavenham grows from being a small town in the 1320s. There are um, seven people recorded with occupational surnames working in the cloth industry to rise to particular prominence in the later 1400s and early 1500s. And the majority of timber buildings in Lavenham date from about 1460 to 1530. I am an established rug weaver and dyer and I will be making the woven length for our textile installation. 
Could you give us a brief description of the role of the hand weaver and other cloth workers during the medieval period? Yes, cloth making included several different activities, including weaving. Some of those activities were carried out before the weaving process, others afterwards. And weavers, as well as other specialised cloth workers, emerged during the Middle Ages. And it was people known as clothiers who coordinated the work of weavers and the other cloth workers, coordinating the processes and in some cases also carrying out aspects of production themselves. So if we run through quickly the different stages of cloth making, it would start by sourcing uh, wool, which would be carefully sorted to remove impurities and discrepancies in the uh, wool fibres. Then the fibres would be combed or carded and they straightened the fibres, separated the shorter from the long, longer strands and removed further imperfections. And then the fibres would be spun into yarn, either hand spinning with a distaff and spindle or wheel spinning. If the um, wool was hand spun with the distaff and spindle, the spindle was a short wooden stick weighted at one end with some clay or stone or wood or lead to improve the rotation and the threads were drawn out and twisted onto that short wooden stick. Another cleft stick about three feet long known as the distaff was placed under the left arm to hold the prepared but unspun wool. If the wool was wheel spun that was usually carried out on a um, spinning wheel which was powered by hand, um, usually um, with a small stick. The spinner would manipulate the thread with their left hand and rotate the wheel with their right. After spinning the wool into yarn, the weaver then had to weave the yarn into cloth. And the cloth is made up of threads running lengthways, laid parallel to each other, known as the warp crossed by threads inserted sideways, known as the weft. And the weaving process consists of inserting the weft between the alternate threads of the warp on a loom. Um, a single weaver could work on a narrow loom, but if a broad cloth was being produced, a cloth of at least one and three quarter yards wide, then two weavers would be needed to work on a broad loom. After the weaving had taken place, the cloth would be taken to a fuller who would then cleanse and thicken the fabrics. The, full and, the fulling process has two functions, to scour, to clean the cloth, to remove it, particularly of oils which had been used to prepare the yarns, um, but also to thicken it, to map the fibres together to give additional strength to the cloth. And the cloth would be scoured with cleaning agents such as fuller's earth um, and it would be soaked and the cloth would be pounded. Initially that was done simply by trampling the cloth underfoot, but increasingly in the Middle Ages the process was carried out by water wheels that powered wooden hammers. Fulling shrank the cloth, so after being rinsed it was attached to wooden frames known as tenters to be dried and stretched back to its correct shape and size. And then finally there was the finishing process which included raising and cropping the nap, the rough layer of projecting fibres on the surface of the cloth, often carried out several times, and then finally the cloth was pressed and packed before being sold. And we still use many terms from the cloth making processes in our everyday speech when we talk about being dyed in the wool or set on tenter hooks. And several common surnames, too, reflect the processes carried out by textile workers. Tucker, Fuller and Walker were all surnames of Fullers, Dyer and Lister for Dyers, and Weather, Weather, Weaver, Weather and Webster were all Weavers. You mentioned in your book, The Medieval Clothier, that in the late 14th and early 16th century, the cloth-making communities of Lavlin became among the 30 wealthiest towns in England. I grew up in Lavenham and my family owned the Great House restaurant on the marketplace for 35 years. It is picturesque and remains today the best preserved Tudor village in England 
the jazz singer Claire Till once described Lavenham as the wonky town. How and why did Lavenham become so wealthy through the cloth trade? Well, Lavenham became wealthy through um, the wealth generated by its individual townspeople who were mainly working in the cloth trade. In 1522, we know that 23 people living in Lavenham were assessed on more than £50 in goods and 21 of these individuals were clothiers, so the vast majority. Lavenham had become so wealthy that in 1524 it actually paid more in total in tax than York, even though it only had a few hundred residents at the time compared to some 7,000 in York. Why the industry developed in Lavenham and in other small towns and villages nearby in South Suffolk and North Essex is a more difficult question to answer. It certainly wasn't because of the presence of raw materials. In fact, Suffolk wool was considered inferior to those produced in most other counties and Fuller's Earth wasn't readily available. A local port wasn't needed, as most of the cloth was sent overland to London. A supply of running water was necessary, but that could be found in many places. I think what places like Lavenham could offer was freedom in terms of, that because they were small places, they did not have the restrictive government and legislation introduced by governments and craft guilds in larger towns like York, which could increase the cost of cloth production. Residents living in larger towns like York also faced the heavier charges of government to maintain the fabric of the city, such as the gates and walls, the bridges and the streets. Places like Lavenham also offered access to labour, a predominantly rural workforce that could work in cloth making as a part-time activity, combining it with their farming. And it also offered access to capital and markets. The rural workforce had capital which it could invest in the cloth making and there were market networks, particularly good trading links with London. Lavenham's managed to retain its charm over these years because the boom in the cloth industry was very short-lived. By the later 1500s, Lavenham was becoming an economic backwater and the townspeople could no longer afford to maintain some of the largest houses. Some of them were actually demolished. They certainly couldn't afford to rebuild their houses in the latest style and so many of the Tudor houses have re been retained ever since. And the cloth industry gradually moved away from the town, so Lavenham never developed the dark satanic mills that we think of in other textile making areas in later periods. We know that Lavenham was home to three generations of the Spring family, who were all wealthy clothiers. The three generations were all rather confusingly called Thomas, but we know that the first Thomas, who died in 1440, probably came from Houghtonley Spring in County Durham. He might have been a sheep farmer there who successfully adapted to making cloth in his new home of Lavenham. By 1425, he was the largest producer in the town. His son, Thomas II, expanded the business further but it was under his son, Thomas III, known as the Rich Clothier, that the Spring family's fortunes reached their peak. Thomas's will records that he had married a wealthy widow, Alice May, who brought him £400 at the time of their marriage. In a tax assessment in 1522, Thomas possessed goods worth over £1,800, far more than anyone living in Lavenham, and, in fact, his estate was the third highest in the whole of Suffolk. His son, Sir John, um, became a gentleman and was knighted, and another of his sons retired from the cloth trade. So we see that a wealthy clothier family like the Springs of Lavenham had moved out of cloth production in the town by the middle of the 1500s.
For our installation, The Alchemy of Blue, half of the piece will be dyed in different shades of indigo and woad's blue. In my early years growing up in Lapnam, I heard stories about the high quality of blue broadcloth dyed in woad, which was the most celebrated in the area and called Lapnam Blue. Now, was this true? And can we use the term Lapnam Blue? And was the blue used for anything else? For example, were the houses in Lavenham also painted in blue? Yes, Lavenham specialised in producing blue cloth. We know that it was one of several centres that produced a very distinctive type of cloth in the later Middle Ages. Other examples include Castle Coombe and Stroud in the Cotswolds, which produced fine red cloths, while Salisbury specialised in striped cloths known as rays. Lavenham cloth was dyed in the wool. In other words, it was usually dyed before being woven. And we find stocks of blue wool mentioned in at least six Lavenham wills from the 1440s. Until indigo began to be imported from the tropics in the later 1500s, the only source of a fast blue dye in Britain was woad. And woad, although it can grow in England, was largely imported, mainly from Toulouse in southwestern France. The leaves of the plant were crushed and dried in balls. And Thomas Spring, the third, the wealthy clothier, left his apprentice, Peter Gage, ten half balls of woad in 1523. These were valued at £16, which is a really large sum when you think that a wage earner might earn £2 in a whole year at that time. So we can definitely say that Lavenham specialised in blue cloth. I'm not sure about painting houses blue. Timber framed houses were often traditionally white, uh, lime washed. If you look at the Corpus Christi Guild Hall at Lavenham, that's a good example of this. Um, they're still carrying out that practice. And over time, um, the weather removes the lime from the timbers, uh, leaving the oak a beautiful silver grey colour. We do know, though, that for the medieval mind, blue was a very important colour. It was often associated with loyalty and fidelity. It's also linked with the veneration of the Virgin Mary. And for those who use blue in manuscripts, the semi-precious stone lapis lazuli and the mineral azurite were the most popular means of producing the blue pigments that were used. Lapis lazuli commonly contains gold particles of pyrites which were often mistaken for gold. We also know that the use of the colour blue in fabric gradually became more fashionable and prestigious in the later Middle Ages. And the late 15th century wardrobe accounts of King Edward IV reveal a particular taste for garments in blue. Perhaps some of this cloth even came from Lavenham. As there is very little written information about the ingredients used and the unique alchemy necessary to transform the green woad leaves into become a blue dye or pigment, were the recipes protected and kept secret? I suspect they probably were. The, the mysteries of dyeing probably form part of the cloth maker's specialist technical knowledge and would have been learned through an apprenticeship or passed on from father to son. Woad was generally imported in casks in dry balls, like those that Thomas Spring left his apprentice, which would then have had to be broken up, moistened with water and fermented for several weeks. The temperature would have been carefully regulated to ensure that all the woad underwent the same degree of fermentation. Potash would have been added as an alkali and a temperature of about 50 degrees degrees Celsius needed to be maintained for two or three days. So most dyers or clothiers who carried out dyeing would have had a, a vat which they would heat, have heated for that process. Woad didn't require a fixing, age or a fixing agent or a mordant to set the dyes to the cloth, but it did need an alkali such as potash to extract the coloured pigment. As a dyer myself, 
Was the role of the dyer in the medieval times more important than the other cloth-making processes, such as spinning and weaving? Well, we know that dyeing added a very significant value to the wool. In the 1580s, it increased its price between 25 and 150 percent. We know, too, that dye houses could be very valuable assets, which might be referred to or left as part shares in wills. We know that Robert Willimott of Lavenham, who died in 1502, left in his will the fourth part of his dye house to his wife Elizabeth. Dyeing was the most skilled craft of the cloth making processes, so dyers earned the most money. In the 1540s, a dyer, a master dyer, might be paid about ten pence a day and his assistants threepence a day whereas a weaver may be paid about four pence a day and a spinner two pence a day. I have lived in York for many years and have frequently visited the magnificent Merchant Ventures Hall. Could you kindly give us more information about this particular building and its relevance to the cloth trade? Yes, it is a magnificent building, isn't it? It's one of the best surviving guild halls in the country. It was built for the Guild of Our Lord Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary, a guild which was licensed in 1357. The guild started building the hall shortly afterwards and established a hospital in the hall by 1372. In the early 1400s, the guild was absorbed by the Guild of Mercers and Merchants, and in turn, they became the Company of Merchant Adventurers of York in 1581. The main part of the building that we see today is the Great Hall and Undercroft, with an exterior of brick and half timbering, which dates mainly from the mid-1300s. A stone chapel was attached to the Undercroft on the southeast, which was rebuilt in the early 1400s. Much of the cloth that was sold by clothiers was shipped by merchants from York and other towns to overseas mer markets, and many of these merchants would have been members of the Guild of Mercers and Merchants that met in the hall. The merchants used the hall to transact their business affairs, meet together socially, look after the poor, and for prayer. As a professional weaver and dyer, I would be very interested to know who had the highest skilled role in medieval times as a cloth worker and why? Well, dyeing was generally considered to be the most skilled role and, as I mentioned, a dyer might be paid about 10 pence a day. And the other tasks that generally received the higher wages were weaving and finishing, about 4 pence a day. We do find some weavers retaining servants and, and paying high tax assessments whereas others seem to have been relatively poor or only undertaken weaving on a part-time basis. The equipment needed for weaving a loom and a shuttle cost around about a pound, whereas a dye house requiring a vat that could be heated was much more expensive equipment. So those clothiers who could carry out the dyeing process themselves would have been at an advantage because they wouldn't have had to hire an expensive dyer to dye their wool or cloth. How many households in England were involved in cloth making processes? Well, the best estimates that we have are that by the 1540s, the amount of cloth that was being produced in England was such that it required about 264,000 cloth workers. That's about one in seven of the adult workforce. Another calculation suggests that by the same time, spinning provided earnings for about one in four households in the country. Many of those workers would have been working part-time in the cloth industry, combining it with farming or domestic work. But of course, more households were involved in cloth making in some areas than in others. In Lavenham in 1522, more than a third of all the trades listed in the town were workers in the textile industry. I am a member of the UK Association of Guilds of Weavers, Spinners and Dyers. 
Please, can you describe the important and historic role of the guilds related to the medieval cloth trade? Many towns had guilds of specific crafts, such as weavers and dyers, and the role of these craft or trade guilds varied between towns due to local politics and, and cultural traditions. Many of these guilds had their origins in religious guilds or fraternities, as we've seen with the merchant adventurers in York, and provided important religious and social functions, as well as an economic role. The craft guilds would have included employers and employees, masters and apprentices. They usually had searchers who were members of the guild who oversaw the conduct of that particular trade and maintained the standards of production. Town governments often delegated the tasks of policing the trades to craft guilds who provided quality assurance and upheld standards of production, but also had a vested interest in maintaining the profits of the trade for their own members. We are currently sitting within the architecture of the medieval King's Manor Court. Could you please describe any links to this fine building with what we have been discussing with you today? The King's Manor was the Abbot's House of St Mary's Abbey. It overlooks the ruins of the Benedictine Monastery, the remains of which are now in the Yorkshire Museum Gardens. King's Manor is a building of stone, brick and pantiles with two courtyards, and one architectural guide describes it as no single part of special merit, but not without a picturesque and in places quirky charm. At the core of King's Manor is the Tudor Abbot's Lodging, which was built by Abbot Sever between 1485 and 1502, probably replacing an earlier abbot's house on the same site. Monasteries like St Mary's were suppliers of wool, they provided cash loans to merchants, and they were consumers of cloth. And a leading monastery like St Mary's would even have recruited some of its monks from the merchant elite in York. Following the dissolution of the monasteries in the late 1530s, the complex was retained by the Crown and from 1561 it became the official residence of the President of the Council of the North. Between 1561 and 1641, when the Council was abolished, the manor was gradually enlarged and extended. After 1688, the manor was leased out divided into apartments and gradually declined. The Yorkshire School for the Education of the Blind was founded in 1833 by the Wilberforce Memorial, a charity that had been established following the death of the Yorkshire MP and reformer William Wilberforce. And the Yorkshire School occupied King's Manor from 1835 until 1958. In 1883, an international conference was held in celebration of the school's jubilee and an exhibition showcasing the work of the students. The funds that were raised were used to purchase the King's Manor from the Crown and open a new department teaching handicrafts to those who had lost their sight after the age of 16. The Yorkshire School for the Education of the Blind gradually restored and enlarged the buildings and, following the closure of the school, it has been occupied since 1963 by the University of York. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr John Lee. Thank you. This recording and project have been made possible by funding from the Arts Council England National Lottery Project Grant. If you would like to know more about the work of Dr John Lee, please visit the website for the Centre for Medieval Studies at the University of York. Thanks to Alfred Hickling for the sound engineering and music. We would also like to thank the University of York for hosting our interview. You can follow the progress of our project on Instagram at the alchemy of blue with underscores between each word. Our textiles installation will be featured at the Collect Art Fair in Somerset House, London Spring 2022 and is organised by the Crafts 
Cancel UK. Thank you very much for listening and we hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you.